Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Brass Junkies. My name is Andrew Hitz and I am joined by a good friend and a world-renowned euphonium player whose name is Hiram Diaz. Hiram, how are you? I'm great. Having a good time this morning. Had a great chat. Yeah, we um, we interviewed um, one of the most accomplished euphonium solos soloists in the world uh, who is the, the whopping age of 31 years old, Glenn Van Loy. Um, what a, he was such a nice guy and so accomplished. This guy, we, we, you know, we unpack all of it with him in this conversation, but it's, uh, it's amazing all that he's accomplished. And he's, uh, just a really nice guy. Great, great player. I hope you guys check out all of his recordings and the stuff that he does on the internet. It's just amazing. He's an incredible player. Great teacher too. I like his pedagogical concepts. And he's just, uh, I can't wait to meet him in person one day. You know, I That's hope that's right. I forgot crossed. that the two of you have not met in person. Yeah. yeah. He and I met at uh, the IET festival uh, that we oh, talked there, there together maybe five years ago, something like that. Very cool. Um, yeah. Super nice guy. Um, yeah. 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 He's wonderful. Um, one of two uh, also wonderful is Parker Mouthpieces, who I'd like to thank for providing the hosting for nice. Brass Junkies. Parker Mouthpieces offers fine, customizable component mouthpieces for horn, trombone, euphonium, and tuba, including the Andrew Hits Artist Model Tuba Mouthpiece. Find out more at parkermouthpieces.com or follow them on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, also, um, on a, a sad note, uh, we mentioned it uh, right towards the end of the conversation with Glenn, but um, it was announced, I believe he passed away the night before, but that uh, Roger Bobo uh, just passed away. Um, yeah, what uh, what are your thoughts there, Hiram? Huge loss. A huge loss, and as I mentioned earlier, just a very early impact, well, you'll hear later in this episode, but a very early impact for me just seeing that type of stages that he took the tuba and the low brass voice he, one yeah. of the amazing things he's a huge inspiration to me about tone color and painting with different tone colors yes he was such a huge proponent of playing the horn that you should play or that you can play yeah. uh, for the music that you're playing which is awesome i'm sure he was just such a pioneer with the manufacturers and uh, what you can't you can't even encapsulate how how small how every facet of his life and his impact uh in in three hours i wouldn't be able to tell yeah. you his his impact so it's awesome it's um it's a huge loss but he led an awesome life and i yeah. hope to even scratch that yeah yeah i'm uh looking right now right over there at uh at a, a bobo custom f uh tuba from yamaha which there is you the, go which is the best f tuba that i've ever played uh and it's not close it's uh yeah it's just uh yeah it's amazing yeah he he um he had like uh five careers <laughs> and it yeah. was all yeah and i and i um my favorite part about him he's one of the best um and most renowned for a reason tuba operators in in history and yet like it was the art that was for you know front and center and it was like the tuba operating served the art rather than some where the tuba operating is the, uh, and this is a, a problem with your instrument sometimes too, very much not in the hands of, uh, of Glenn, right. Uh, or of oh, you, yeah. but where the, oh, yeah. you know, where the art is kind of, uh, you know, um, is subservient to the tuba or euphonium operating. Um, that's a, that's and, a great point. Great yeah. point. Yep. And, and I respect the hell out of people like, like you, like Glenn, like Roger, who can operate it at that high of a level, but that's never the headline. I mean, that's like, yeah, that's just the, um, you know, that's the, what need, that's the, the price of admission to be able to play the stuff that you do, how you do it is to be, you got to be able to operate the euphonium at a really high level. And uh, Boba was a real pioneer there where it's just like, it was all about musical storytelling um, and how he did it was not as important as, uh, as what he was saying. So, yeah. Beautiful. Yep. All right. Well, um, yeah. Thank you to uh, we uh, we heard a, a great um, a great story of a horn failure uh, in the bonus episode with Glenn mm. um, and about how um, yeah he got someone in uh, in <laughs> in an elite brass band yelled at when it wasn't their fault. Uh, that was a gem. Uh, if you want to um, to hear what Glenn was just sharing about 
if you go to patreon.com slash the brass junkies then you can uh learn um about how to support the show and about how to make uh conversations like this one possible um thank you to everybody who has uh been a booster of the brass junkies uh for the all these years and continues to you are very much appreciated uh, and you get access to a lot of stuff including bonus episodes with all the guests and uh, I just wanted to thank you, Hiram, for uh, waking up early. We had to fit this in before uh, Glenn started teaching. So we hit at 8 a.m. this morning. That was early. So, wow. Um, yeah, yeah, we did it, man. We I was there. It. Yeah. Wow. Uh, look I, we at were me. both there. Yeah. Look at me. My computer wasn't, but we, we made it. So, uh, all right. Without further ado, let us get to the conversation that we had with international euphonium superstar Glenn Van Loy. All right. And today on the Brass Junkies, not only is my uh, beautiful co-host Hiram Diaz one of the best euphonium players in the world, uh, but we are joined uh, by uh, one of the most accomplished euphonium soloists in the world. His name is Glenn Van Loy. Glenn, how are you? I'm fine, thanks. How are you? I'm doing well. It's, uh, it's really great to have you here. Um, I asked uh, Hiram uh, if he would be willing to be a guest co-host for this, and um, and he, I think, felt obligated. So he said, yeah, I guess so. No, he said, absolutely, with an exclamation point. And then I said, who would you like to interview? And uh, you were the very first name that he texted me. He was like, we got to see if we can get Glenn. And you've been on the list for a while. Um, it's uh, There's only 26 episodes a year, and there's only like five per instrument. So it kind of takes a while to like get through the list. But I'm really glad that your name popped up because you have had a fascinating career. And how old are you? You're not even that old. Uh, I'm, well, it changes every year, doesn't it? 31. <laughs> <laughs> you it does. That is a moving target. Don't worry. As you get older, it gets easier to keep track of how old you are. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's Glenn, did you notice how a blank stare came across Andy's face when you told him where you live? He just had no idea where that was. And it was great to watch him just be like, okay. <laughs> Can we see the writing sheet where he wrote it down? Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah right. All, all I wrote was the valleys in Switzerland. So yeah, and then you said near, and then I was like, wait, I can't spell that. Uh, what, what is the city that you're nearest? Uh, it's Sion. Sion. The, yeah. Switzerland is the most beautiful country that I've ever been to in the world. It's like it's it's obnoxious. It's very it's very it's pretentiously beautiful. It's yes. like yeah, it's yeah. amazing. Yeah, really, really incredible. But you, I uh, grew up in Belgium. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I've only moved to Switzerland uh, seven years ago, I think. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. And uh, you got your start uh, from your father, who was a bass trombonist. Can you tell us uh, about how uh, you got your start with him? Um, yeah, my my dad was a bass trombone player, or is a bass trombone player, and a, an amateur conductor. Um, so on Friday nights, he would go to uh, to the local fanfare band to conduct them. Um, and uh, my sister and I, we would we would go along because my mom was in the band as well. Um, and uh, we would listen to the first half of the uh, rehearsal. And then they put us in, in bed because um, it was in, in the president's garage. So we went to the house. Then there was like a, um, a baby phone. Um, and then so they could hear us cry during the rehearsal. Um, <laughs> if, if we cried, <laughs> of course, we, we never did. Um, <laughs> And then uh, we I, we made friends. I, I was a little bit older. I could stay up for the whole rehearsal. Started to to play also, and then that's how I played the euphonium. And then my dad was my first teacher. It was my first band uh, where I played. And then I went to other teachers, and and then everything started. Wow. You should tell you should tell Americans what a fanfare band is. Uh, a fanfare band is. Almost exactly the same as a wind band, but instead of the whole clarinet choir, uh, you've got flugelhorns. So the three voices are covered by uh, 10 or 12 flugelhorns. Okay. Hmm. 10 or 12 flugelhorns. Is there anything more nightmarish than 10 or 12 flugelhorns? <laughs> yeah, and you're... That's, that, that's what everybody says. But actually, if you, if you grow up with it and it's it's... It's better than 10 or 12 clarinets, isn't it? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. 
Oh yeah. Now I'm gonna. I've never received hate mail from clarinet players before. I think uh, in general they've. Uh, now I'm gonna get angry clarinet emails. That's uh. That, that's pretty funny. Hiram, you should ask the president's own Marine Band if there could be a concert where you could replace the clarinets with flugelhorns. Well, flugelhorns. That'd yeah. be nice. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah, I think if you capture the sound of flugelhorn, you're right. If you grow up with it, it starts to get in your mind. And that's the sound that you are attracted to and are after. And it's a beautiful sound. It's a beautiful, yeah. warm sound. And if people are really dexterous and play really well on the flugelhorn. I'm sure it sounds amazing. I'm sure it sounds amazing. Yeah, yeah. and it's. I think it's when, when there's only one flugelhorn, like in a brass band, it's difficult to get the intonation right. But if everybody plays wrong, then it sounds right, doesn't it? Yep. It's, it's called like a... it's called molto vibrato. That's what it's called. <laughs> it sounds like a fleet of aircraft all coming yeah at one time. It's just kind of like a low hum. Yeah. Uh, that's uh that's wonderful. I'm fascinated by the by the community aspect of like ensembles like that in uh in various um, European countries like like Belgium and it's just it's amazing that you grew up in that that there was a scenario. Can you imagine Hiram in America, if it was like, yeah, I can come, I'll conduct the band and my wife will play in the band, but we have to bring our babies. <laughs> you know I mean? It's just like, this just kind of, right. it, it wouldn't get that far. Right. It'd be like, get no. a babysitter, you know, like right. yeah, you can't bring the babies. Right. We would, you would be, uh, that would just not fly. You're absolutely no. right. It would just not fly. I think it used to fly about a hundred years ago with community yeah. bands in the United States and yeah. But uh, that is no longer the case. Yeah, I've, I've never tried it over here in Switzerland when I conducted my bands. Maybe I should, yeah. Yep. yeah. There you go. There you go. Yeah, just, you know what? Uh, no one is going to, uh, to make you, like, put your baby outside. So if you just show up with a baby, they're going to accommodate. You might not ever be <laughs> invited back to conduct. But, but well, what we know. missed here, what we missed here is that someone procreated with Glenn. Someone, he, someone actually... <laughs> decided to stay with glenn and have children with him i'm really impressed i'm impressed that you have kids it's yeah great. two it's yeah, great. yeah wow <laughs> sorry I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you two go at it here yeah it's like I'm, no yeah you know anytime there's two world-renowned euphonium players on the same call it can get a little bit tense so um so do you remember your earliest um like earliest memory of saying i want to play in that band was it just kind of something that you always wanted to do was play in band and then you finally uh, got your start um yeah i think I, I made a couple of friends and the only thing i was i wanted to sit next to the, the best friend i made and it happened to be the euphonium player um so normally in belgium you start on flugelhorn or, or cornets or trumpets um but i didn't want to um so that's yeah i i I can remember that I wanted to sit next to the guy, and in the end, I never, I never sat next to him because he quit before I entered the band. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know if I've got something to do with it, but um... <laughs> <laughs> he pre-quit. He's like, <laughs> he quit before you yeah. even got there. Well, that's a that's a fascinating story. So you chose the euphonium to sit next to a specific friend who quit, and you were like, I guess I'll just become famous then. Uh, which like <laughs> by the way you were um you were uh, you started studying privately with your father right and then like and yep. you caught on and what age did you start taking private lessons from him uh i think i was about seven seven or seven and a half oh, wow. yeah because uh, you pictures of me and I, I can't touch the floor when i sit on the uh, on oh. the chair and i'm trying to hold the euphonium that's that's awesome and uh, you joined a uh, the festival brass band at age eleven, which like yeah. has is that the youngest person to ever play in that band? Uh, in that particular band, yes. I'm not sure how if I was the youngest um, ever in in Belgium brass banding because um, of course there's a lot of Violet uh, friends Violet's son um, who who was like thirteen when he played his first European Championships or something. Um, but yeah, I, I was in a in kind of a B band, and they always did a concert together. And um, I was watching the concert of this festival brass band. And then the second euphonium, he had uh, like a, a mental breakdown during the concert, and then oh, he wow. just walked off. Um, no and then after I, I didn't go and sit in because I was not capable of doing it. Um, <laughs> but my teacher, he, he was playing in the band too, and then they they asked if I could join. 
for the next rehearsal because he, he never came back. The guy, he just quit playing. Wow. Um, so that's when I just rolled into the, uh, into the brass band as second euphonium. Yeah. Wow. At age 11. Yeah. yeah. That's my pretty serious. Very happy. <laughs> yeah. My yeah parents because of the rehearsals. Happy. Yeah. The <laughs> rehearsal was on, on Monday <laughs> night. So on Monday night we would rehearse till 10, 10 30 sometimes. And it was an hour away so by the time I got home, um, so the first few times, the president of the band, he lived close to where I live. Uh, so he uh, he drove me, but um, he, he liked to stay for a few beers. So I was still way too young to stay up. Um, so in the end, my dad uh, did all the uh, all, all the driving. I'm just, pic I'm just picturing Glenn. Different culture. Yeah, right. And I'm just picturing him like rolling in at like you know like one one thirty in the morning. You're like, yeah, you know, we we hit the pub. You know, we're uh, we're you know just <laughs> at eleven. <laughs> little section bonding time. <laughs> just to make clear, I didn't drink. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's fascinating that you got the opportunity uh, because somebody left the group and then you got thrust in there. Can you bring us? what was it like in that very first rehearsal like the beginning of that rehearsal like how nervous were you um i can't really remember i i can remember the pieces we've played we played a piece by uh, philip spark and uh, and um uh, jan van der roost um but i was just i think i didn't have time to be nervous because i've never seen so difficult euphonium parts so i was just looking at it and, and trying to play it so hmm. I didn't really, maybe I was too young to be nervous. I right. love it. Because the, the older you get, the more nervous you. Oh, yeah. 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 Didn't have time to get nervous. That's, uh, that's a really great, uh, that's a really great line. Yeah, I love it. And so you then joined the uh, uh, Brass Band Heist, if I'm pronouncing that uh, correctly. Uh, and you were the solo euphonium there for, for 10 years. Yeah, so I, I did both of them simultaneously because they weren't in the same uh, same uh, league, if you want. They weren't in the same division. Um, so Brasman Heist was a new band, a village band, very close to where I live. Um, okay. And my dad played bass drum on there as well. So we, we went to rehearsals. It wasn't on the same day and it wasn't in the same division. So I could I could do both. Um, but then we got some success and we, we went up the the divisions and then i had to choose when we came into the championship division um so then i decided to stay with brasman heist because it was close and and we formed it together from the third division on to the championship division so i think i must have been 16 or 17 16 maybe when uh, or 17 when we were in the uh, in the top section and uh, maybe Hiram knows this, but I don't. I don't know anything about how bands move from division to division. Can you talk to us about that a little bit? Yeah. So uh, there's national competitions, and then if you win, you can go up a division, or um, if or you can stay. I think a second year, but if you win two uh, two consecutive years, then you have to go up. Um, so I think that's what we did with Heist. We we won twice, and then we went up a division. And then we won twice again just to to get the band on that level uh, and to to make sure we didn't go too fast. Um, the, and then the, so after a couple of years, we went to the top section. The better question is, how do you drop divisions? Uh, right? Is it relegation like the Premier League? Well, there's one. No, <clears throat> you you only drop division if you got less than eighty points, which they never okay. give. So in Belgium, there's there used to be a pyramid with bottom section bands, and then you've got the the higher you go, the less bends, but now it's just like <laughs> inverted. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. That makes sense. So it's very difficult to play in um, the, actually the lower divisions. There's just not much competition. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that you might go to the, to the national competition and before going, you know, that you're going to win because, because <laughs> there's only one band, but then <laughs> if, if the top section bands lose players, then they've got no fishing pound from the bottom to, to search for players. So it's kind of, I think it's kind of the wrong way around and it's, it's a bit of a problem. Hmm. Maybe they should limit the number of bands in the championship section. Yeah. Or, or get very severe adjudicators and then just, yeah. right. 
people I, who have nothing to lose i will go adjudicate the belgian nationals <laughs> so that no, no one knows me and no one cares about me and be like you all sound terrible and then they can fire me and bring somebody else in there yeah. you go they should hire you and i hire them as consultants be like we've we've known about the situation for three minutes and we've got some ideas on how you yes. can improve yes. yeah the, just the whole system yeah this whole yeah, points it. thing i'm getting rid of it i'm that's just doing smiley faces and <laughs> alligators <laughs> and rain that's clouds very, that's a very american thing for us to like basically know nothing about it be like okay so here's what you all should be doing you know, right. let me, yeah yeah like I'll, right. i've got some thoughts <laughs> yes yeah. let me show you how to fix this <laughs> uh before we move on from the um from this competition thing because i find this this thing really fascinating well um a little over 10 years ago uh, with boston brass we um played uh, at, at one of these uh, big competitions in in London, and I couldn't tell you which one it was. We obviously weren't uh, competing as a brass band, but we performed uh, at it. It was fascinating to just like see the whole thing, and it was it was really kind of uh, it was neat to be a you know a small part of it for a day. But can you take us behind the scenes of like how often are, are there competitions, and then like what does the run up to uh, to a competition look like in terms of like rehearsing and how many rounds there are? You don't. Have to, I'm sure you can answer for 45 minutes, but just maybe the overview for somebody like me yeah. who doesn't really understand. I think it depends in uh, where, where you are in in mm -hmm. Europe, um, sure. but in Belgium and in Switzerland, it's quite similar. We've got our nationals once a year in November and it's okay. it's actually the same weekend so I can never go to the Belgian nationals anymore because I'm in Switzerland now interesting um, and you start your uh, run-up um, in to, to the competition in the end of August uh, you start with uh, the two pieces so there's two pieces to play um, you rehearse them we rehearse once a week and then leading up to the contest we'll do a couple of weekends and then uh, two weeks before the contest, it's almost every day uh, that we're together, um, mm. and and maybe you get in a consultant to work for a weekend. Um, that's where you guys can come in. Yeah, <laughs> and, I'd be like, then, you guys sound great. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, <laughs> more dynamics. Yeah, you can always say more dynamics. Yeah, I would just make yeah. shit up. <laughs> 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 and, and then we go to the uh, to the competition and then we've got uh, uh, both pieces to play uh, and then if you win you go to the Europeans which is in May uh, and if you don't win you cry and have a beer <laughs> you drink until May <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay so so the uh, I'm assuming the pieces are not announced until the end of August is that why the rehearsing starts then or do you know well ahead uh I think we will find out in March, actually, uh, ah. in Switzerland, okay. what the test piece is going to be. Okay. And then the own choice. So there's one test piece, which all the bands play the same. And then there's an own choice selection. And then we can just pick uh, anything we want. So whenever we, we've decided, we, we know. Um, but it's just over here in Switzerland, everybody's got their own village band still um, next to the competitive brass band. Um, and uh, so we don't want to uh, put too much uh, pressure on, on everybody. So we, we start in August because then the village bands, they just had the break or, um, and then we go till, with Valesia Brass Band, my band, um, we go till the nationals. And then if we win, we go to the Europeans and start in March for May. So we, we have, it's kind of, projects and most bands work the same just to to have some time because it's so intense when when it's on that you need time off as well how many concerts do you guys do of this music do you only ever play it for the yeah it's really well, interesting <laughs> my my but my band does zero concerts we've got one concert and it's the week the week before the competition <clears throat> um just to and, and then we play uh some entertainment uh music and and a, right. a, an encore and a march and the two big pieces just to something show with a to... drum set and a backbeat right yeah. <laughs> some of that oh, music oh, also some tom devoren music as well some tom devoren music yeah. yes that also often has a drum and backbeat <clears throat> and a hi hat yeah hi hat that's right that's right. <laughs> I can't decide whether I'm going to edit out Hiram singing that or if I'm going to clip that and put that at the very beginning of the interview, like before we even start talking. That's uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
That's really See, fascinating that yeah. you don't play any concerts. I, I, that's a, I'm glad you asked that question, Harmon, because I, I, I never would have guessed that. I have caught flack from a lot of European players. They're like, you've never heard of this band? You've never heard of that band? It's like, well, I'm not in brass band culture very often. And if you guys don't play concerts, how am I supposed to know about your music? Hmm. You, all you guys do is the competitions. So I think that's a yeah. really interesting <clears throat> difference from it's, it's amateur music. Yeah. Yeah, that, especially for, for our band, because there are uh, competitive bands over here in Switzerland that do a lot of concerts. But it's... yeah. Uh, I've got a feeling our conductor is just a, um, a bit aware of, of everybody's schedule. Um, right. We've got right. parents in, in, in the band as well. Um, I, I find it a shame and, and sometimes I try and push to, to get a concert because um, we were, t- uh, in 2018, we were the European champions. Uh, Amazing. But, but nobody hears us. So, <laughs> so we get a lot of questions. Oh, can you come and do a gala concert? And then it's always no. <laughs> Right. So they they even said no to to uh, to record my solo CD. <laughs> wow. Oh. Yeah. You do need us as consultants, Glenn. I'm telling you. Yeah. yeah. The, the the Hiram and Hits show can uh, come in and yeah set things straight. That's really really fascinating. And so this band exists to play in the competition, and if it goes well in the national, yeah, that's 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 really interesting. But you just said, I'm glad you said this too, that not all of the bands are that way, right? Uh, either no, in yeah. Belgium or in Europe, uh, in you know, in general. So, um, yeah, interesting. Um, I want to uh, ask you about um, uh, each of the 95 international solo competitions that you have won. Uh, in the last decade. Uh, but before we do that, uh, I wanted to uh, take a second to mention uh, the Mary Pappert School of Music at Duquesne Ooh. University. Um, Hiram, if you ever decide that you want to start taking euphonium seriously, uh, you can um, you can go to, uh, to the Mary Pappert School. Uh, Duquesne is right. awesome. Uh, Pittsburgh is a wonderful, uh, thriving arts city here in the United States. It is not in Belgium, uh, in case you, you don't know where Pittsburgh is. It is uh, it is here in the United States. Some people say it's the East Coast. Some people say it's the Midwest. Some people say it's like both. Some people say it's neither. It's a little bit of controversy there. I'm not gonna weigh in on that um, personally. Cause I, you think Pennsylvania is like East Coast, but then like Pittsburgh is like close to Ohio. So it's like, which is like, yeah, anyway. Uh, if it I, takes I, you, if it takes you more than half a day to drive to the beach, it's not the East Coast. Well, I'm, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> but there's a lot of people who think that f- consider Phoenix the West Coast, which again, it's like you know, like San Diego is like six hours away. So, um, but I, I, I don't know why, why we just uh, maybe we can talk about Belgian <laughs> uh, geography next. The uh, you can you can name some places that I don't know, so I can make that face again, Hiram, where I'm just like sure, and then actually he could maybe mention five Belgian places, but one of them is imaginary and. We can see if I can figure out right. which, uh, you know, right. Antwerp. There's like a few that I'm uh, like, I know are real places, but then. Uh, although I think in Belgium, it's like the distance from uh, one coffee shop or uh, <laughs> chocolatier to the next. Yeah, That's you how go. you measure things in Belgium. You're just like, oh, it's from, it's uh, 20 minutes from this chocolate place. So. I do have to say, I've got a bone to pick with Glenn. This is the longest uh, uh, Duquesne uh, spot ever, but I've been paid to play the tuba in like like 30 countries or something. Belgium is not one of them, so I don't know what's up with that. But anyway, I digress again. Um, the uh, the So if you would like to learn more about uh, studying with the uh, the world-renowned uh, faculty at, uh, at Duquesne, uh, James Gourlay, who's a uh, you know big name in the uh, in the brass band world and in the international soloing world, he's uh, one of the many brass professors that they have there. Um, but uh, they have actually made a special page for Brass Junkies listeners, which you can find in the show notes. So if you are a young musician, uh, I would strongly encourage you to check out uh, that link uh, when you're starting to think about uh, either undergrad or graduate school um, for studying music. It's also a great school for other things, but the, the other schools haven't paid us, so we're not going to plug them. <laughs> uh, anyway, thank you to Jim Nova and to uh, all the powers that be um, for uh, helping to make uh, discussions like this one with Glenn are possible. So, um, Glenn, how did you... Uh, so, you have won every category of solo competition in Belgium. You've won the European Solo Championships in Linz, Austria. You were the youngest ever winner, I believe, of the British Open Solo Championship. Uh, you've won the um, the International Soloist of the Year at the Ern Keller Memorial in Sydney, Australia. Uh, you won the Jeju International Brass Competition in South Korea. You're, I'm I'm not like close to the end of the list here. It like goes on and on and on. Um, 
what what's the first competition international competition that you won do you remember uh i think the first international competition was the uh there was one in paris but it was quite small but it just looks good on my cv <laughs> <laughs> no, nobody knows that there was nobody there only me and my dad <laughs> that was the that was the division like you were talking about before the lower bands in belgium sometimes you show up and you know you're gonna win because you're the only one yeah his right. father is who like founded the competition and just didn't tell him like, glenn you're the only one here there you go <laughs> yep you know all it took was a plane flight to well, probably a train to paris yeah there you go <laughs> Um, no, <laughs> all, yeah. all jokes aside, I, I think um, uh, it was the uh, the world music com contest in, in Kirkrade, um, which was only like for the solo competition. I know for the band competition, uh, like if it's marching band or wind band, it's like really world music contest uh, from all over the world. Um, but for the solo competition, it was more Benelux. Um, so Belgium, Netherlands and Luxembourg. Okay. Um, so I, I think... That was the first one I did. Um, and it was interesting because it was one of the first one ones where I played against saxophones and clarinets and everything. So it was not only brass. Um, and then the second one actually was uh, the British Open in 2008. Yeah. Awesome. Did you know at that point that you wanted to start competing more often? Did you have success immediately, basically? Did, was this your your first competition did you win uh yeah i did yeah i think i did yeah yeah um so i did the first the first competitions i did were just the regional ones uh in belgium okay. uh, right. and then the national one um and there, there was another euphonium guy and we were always first or second and he was a bit older so he, he was in a division Robert? above me as well no he's <laughs> from the netherlands oh okay <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right 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 <clears throat> No, it was a guy called Nick Vermeer. He, he actually plays in, in my former band now, uh, Brass Band Heist. Great. Um, so it was always, always him or me uh, that were one or two. Um, <laughs> and then afterwards, um, yeah, I, w I went to international competitions because uh, my dad, he knew that I was, I was really interested in it and he looked it up on the internet uh, and then he would, he would drive me there. So Nice. That's wow. awesome. It, what's awesome is that um, you had somebody so supportive, but then you also had all of these opportunities close by. Uh, it's it's not necessarily that we have to find opportunities for euphonium players in the United States. You can compete against other instruments, but what I really like about this brass banding culture is how often you can, well, comparison is the it's not great, but where you can figure out where you stand in your community. I really like, okay, I am not good. I need to practice. <clears throat> or I am progressing. This is going well. I can hear myself. But that's one of the great things about these competitions is that you get to hear all of the other players and you get to basically compare yourself like, all right, this is kind of the, this is the trajectory of my life. Well, this is what I want to be doing. Do you find that- yeah that's kind of how your ears taught you what you wanted to do or what do you think? Uh, I think so. Yeah. Cause um, I, I was always listening to the others cause my, 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 I've got a sister and she's two years older. So she was in, uh, in, in the older age groups. So I would listen to her and to the other um, elder people too. <laughs> what, what does she play? <laughs> elder people. Uh, she, she used to play trumpet, but now she's on trombone. Okay. Uh, but when, when we were kids and, and we're, uh, in the competitions it was trumpet um and then if the, the thing is the funny thing is if if i heard another euphonium player another good euphonium player uh in a higher division and they had a, a, a nice piece on then i would just go and get a photocopy of the piece and the same day of the competition i was i got home and i started to practice it for the next year or wow. um I, I i can i've got vague souvenirs that i i practiced on the same day of the competition just when getting back home um because <laughs> it just it was so motivated yeah. think about how that's related to your oral memory uh, as part of my teaching is how you had just heard someone who <clears throat> sounded really really good right and you're like man i want to do that so then you bought the piece and you tried to sound just like it almost right you're like i want to yeah i want to sound great like that person that's yeah, such yeah, good exactly. ear training yeah i love and that I, I remember even sometimes we all have those days that you're you're not motivated at all to play uh, right. i would 
I would put on the, the DVDs um, of the European Brasman Championships and watch nice. it. And then I would just go practice it. It just gives yeah. me so much motivation. <laughs> yeah. I do that with uh, Andy playing tuba all the time. I just put on videos of him when I'm not motivated to practice. I'll just put on videos of Andy playing with Boston. And be like, man, this is this guy. <laughs> Thank you. You remember that if I can make a living doing this, anyone can. So that's yeah, basically that's the, it, right. Yeah, yeah, nice, nice, nice low bar. Um, that's a. Uh, I love the 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 two sides of your story, which Hiram just pointed out. Well, both of them, but I'll reiterate here is like the support that you had, like right. You had a family that was like getting you to all these places, but then being being so curious and being so assertive and like going up saying, "I want, can I have that music? Can I want?" And then taking it home and then starting right away. And so, um, makes it a lot easier when you have supportive family. But it also makes it a lot easier when when you're driven like you uh, were and continue to be when you hear somebody that can do something that you can't on your instrument or others. And then say you hear Hiram and say, wow, listen to that. I want to, you know, like I can do that, but not quite as well as he can. And then I'm guessing that you get in the practice room <laughs> and close the and, door. Yeah. 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 And, until that's not the case anymore, which is great. But I think as a euphonia player, that's what you have to do because um I, I'm sure Hiram, it's maybe the same, but when I was young and, and started to win the competitions and started started to get better, um, and I was playing in this this festival brass band with some professional players, they would all come up to me after a rehearsal and say, oh, it's great what you're doing, but it's a euphonium. Uh, if you want to be a professional musician, go and play the trombone because you, you've got the abilities to do it and, and try the trombone. But it's I tried it, of course, um, and, and I did it as a second instrument in in uh, in university, um, but it's not what I wanted to do because I was always so curious about the euphonium. And I think to to be with some of the top players on your instrument, you you have to have that ability and and, and that motivation because otherwise, yeah, we I could have picked a trombone and and maybe win an audition or well, I was crap with the slides or maybe not. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Lance LeDuc used to say when he learned how to play trombone in order to join Boston Brass, and which he played euphonium as well, but he used to say in master classes all the time, how hard can it be trombone players do it? <laughs> <laughs> which, some, which some trombone players found funny, and then there were some that would get very offended. So, yeah, it was a good way to figure out which ones you'd want to hang out with. and which Those ones are the ones that have trouble with the slide. Right. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, ah, oh, <laughs> shedding and just crying. <laughs> Glenn, you know who's a really good trombone player, even though they won't admit it, is Hiram. I've played a number of gigs with him on trombone. And like, first one of those that I showed up and he had a trombone, he was like, he was like, sorry, ahead of time. Like, I suck. Like, just tell me, like, tell me what needs fixing. And then he sounded great. I mean, you know, it's like, yeah. So anyway, um, he's, yeah. He's not a world I, I famous trombone player, but he's. No. Uh, yeah. I would say, Glenn, that I did experience some of that, especially from family members and professional musicians. They're like, dude, and they, they would actually give me professional trombone CDs, like, see how good this sounds? Like, you could be doing this and that. And... <laughs> but I was just a mediocre trombone player, you know? But yeah. I was a great euphonium player, but a mediocre. I was like, I, you know, I've already. I've already crested that hill. Like, all right, let's go. I, I, I let me let me ride this this uh, euphonium train before, like, because Tremont would have been like, <laughs> just dead in the bottoms for many many years again. So, <laughs> and and euphonium is just a cooler instrument. It's just a wild instrument. Just wild sounding. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Um, can you take us behind the scenes of, let's just choose one of these, like uh, Jeju uh, International Brass Competition. That's a good one. What what does that look like in terms of like, do you have to, uh, do, you, do you have to audition to get in there or is someone on your level invited? Like talk to us about the, and then I want to unpack what it's like once you actually get there. Yeah, I, I think it, it's maybe different now because COVID made everything different, but I think when I did it, you just subscribe and then and then uh, you go. Okay. <laughs> you 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 pay to go. <laughs> you, right. you buy your tickets and 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 you're in. But maybe now with COVID, um, they've done a preliminary round um, <clears throat> on on video. But okay. I I don't think it was a case when I did it. Okay. And then 
Uh, how how many days is it, and how many rounds is it? It's been a while. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I I think I was there for for a little bit over a week, um, and then there's one two. I think there's three rounds plus the final, okay. um, so three rounds with piano, um, with luckily uh, one or two days in between, uh, and then the final is with orchestra. Um, um, which is different from the European one because that that was a tough one. It was a, an, another round every day, another program every day. It was also wow. three rounds plus uh, plus a concerto in the final. Wow! So that was over four days, the European yeah, was, solo yeah. championships. Yeah. Wow! And uh, was that um, the four days in a row of four different rounds? Was that harder physically or harder mentally? I think especially mentally, because you would go in and the preliminary round would be in the morning. You get the result at noon and or or if first round takes a little bit longer. And then in the evening, you've got another rehearsal with the pianist because it was in Austria. I didn't take my own pianist. So everybody had, had the same pianist. So you would play your piece, then wait and then go rehearse back uh, for the next day. But of course, you don't want to smash your lip during that rehearsal, but you need to rehearse to get it together. Um, hmm. I can remember the, the third round, it was uh, uh, Symphonic Variants, which is like a nightmare to yes. play phys physically <laughs> yes. and, and to get together with all those rubatos and yes. all the different tempos. Um, so I had a bit of a breakdown. I said, oh, I, can't, I can't rehearse anymore. We, we, we have to stop. And then luckily the pianist, she was so kind that she, she fitted in an extra hour in the morning but that, oh, wow. that, that meant that I had to <clears throat> practice in the morning plus right. play play the piece. Wow. Uh, but it, it all went okay afterwards. But it, I remember that when I came to Jeju, I think I think I did Jeju afterwards when I came to Jeju, um, and it was like different days. There, there was a day rest in between. Mm -hmm. That was like, oh, I can practice <laughs> and then rehearse with the piano right. and go out have have some drinks with the guys and then do the next round. Nice. Fascinating. Yeah, it's uh I I've uh Hiram, have you done solo competitions? Yeah, I did. Yeah. I've only done Falcone and iTech and uh I did one in France. Uh I don't think it exists anymore. Concours Tour I think did, it I don't did know. Did your dad exists. make that one up like uh like <laughs> Glenn's did? <laughs> no, I was about to say no, no I was that about one. To say. That was the first time that that competition had become international. So uh, I went on a military space available flight to Germany. Wow. And this is, this is a great story. I learned how to drive stick shift on the Autobahn, on the German Autobahn. I learned Seems how to drive safe. stick shift. It's a great story. I'll tell you some other time. <laughs> it was not. But anyway. Um, We're going to have I you was... tell that during the bonus episode. <laughs> yeah, okay. That's, that's I was, perfect. I was the only foreigner in the finals, and it was because I had no idea you could bring your own accompanist to these to this competition. So I got smoked because there was a 30-minute uh, concerto, 30-minute euphonium concerto um, by Gabriel Filippo. It's actually a great concerto. Have you heard of this concerto? No. Oh, it's awesome. It's great. Very French. It's amazing. Beautiful piece. But that was the finals piece. And I just got I just got whooped on because I had rehearsed with the piano. I rehearsed with the pianist for 45 minutes for a 30 minute piece once. And I was like, good luck. I'm like <laughs> Godspeed. <laughs> yeah. But no, I did I did all the I did all the competition stuff. And what I found was again, uh, like I was talking about, you just it teaches your ears exactly what those people sound like and i've lost competitions and won competitions and i i think the ones that i lost i learned way more than the ones that i won you know i just was able to be like okay this is what they're looking for this is what i'm i'm going for this is what i'm listening to these people sound so much better than i do or these people are prepared in a different way than i am so <laughs> yeah yeah well the international ones are, are quite interested as well because you you can hear the difference in in playing you can almost um, hear their language. That's true. Yeah, almost. Yeah, yeah. Oh. So w when I did Jeju, uh, there was uh, Chris Buckley was there, uh, Greg Batista. Oh, um, yeah. So all, all those, all those uh, American guys. And then. Oh, wow. There was, so that was, there was two, when was that? 2008, 2009? Uh, nine, maybe. Nine, I think. It was nine. Yeah. 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 I, and then I had a baby. Japanese. <laughs> oh, 
Yeah. I couldn't so, afford to go to Jeju. <laughs> so you had a baby when you were 12. <laughs> basically. That's, that's very young. Yeah, yeah basically. Thank Hiram's you. like, you know, I could have I could have beaten you, Glenn, but I had a baby. <laughs> yeah. Like, for the record, you're lucky I had a baby and I didn't show up. <laughs> <That's pretty good. laughs> that was a very trumpet player of him there. That was uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I had a baby. <laughs> <laughs> um, Glenn, what aspect of euphonium playing do you find the most difficult or the most challenging he's gonna say That's nothing true. yeah <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> now we're gonna no, get real trumpet like now there's there's nothing i find challenging anymore yeah no if if you've got trouble just change mouthpiece like trumpet players <laughs> that's that's it no i think um uh clarity is is maybe the 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 biggest challenge because it's uh it, very easily the, the euphonium sounds big and, and a bit wooly uh, and then people say oh it's just made for slow melodies um, but I think to to get it really clear and and also clear in in the, the back of the hole um, uh, is, is the biggest challenge maybe yeah or playing with an orchestra because we're up uh, our, our bell faces upwards uh, and to be heard it's it's not always easy like if you're a trumpet player or a trombone player you're just blow into the audience and we just <laughs> blow in, into the roof um so that those are the, the things I, I find the most challenging maybe yeah have you done a lot of orchestral playing uh like in the orchestra yeah itself you mean yeah. um i did i did some when i was in belgium yeah uh, okay. like i've done planets and 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 uh, uh musorsky and uh, all that stuff a trumpet concerto um also with a euphonium part in there which was okay. which was very nice um by kalevi no what's his name kalevi aho oh the finnish okay. finnish composer mm -hmm. right uh, really good music um but over here in uh, sometimes they send me an email but it's not worth taking time off here and, and right. sit in the orchestra in belgium um so uh it's it's been a bit less now did, what did you find like the challenges of being clear and pointing up versus the trombones and trumpets what did you change something about your playing did you change your equipment or uh, i never change equipment no um but i i think i changed maybe the, the speed of the air a little bit and and a more direct attack uh to, just to match and to be together with them um it's completely different than playing in a, in a brass band yeah i feel i completely agree uh when i go from concert band to chamber to marching band to orchestral music i find that they everybody in the brass sections always wants me to have as pointed a sound as possible like a very direct and really like go for it kind of sound <clears throat> i've done a lot of the orchestral playing myself and i always find that uh they they like bright euphonium they would rather yeah. hear bright euphonium than beautiful euphonium <laughs> yeah I, I remember i was playing the planets um and and when it, that euphonium part comes in the conductor just kept asking more more but i was like i'm, I'm giving everything it was like yeah. da, 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 da. Right. okay the tongue is going to come back from the back of the hall and slap him <laughs> in the back of the head because yeah, it's like <laughs> it's going over there man <laughs> So I never want to hear this recording. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's just a co totally different beast. It's totally different. Yeah. yeah. I, I uh, nobody asked, but I will say that um, that in my experience, that the the best low brass players uh, in the world that I have heard, of which I'm on a, a call with two of them right now, clarity is is like one of the things that separates those that that best from even just like the really good um and it's just i think it's and, and um I, I think it starts with an awareness which you clearly have right like where that, that it's a problem and then how to actually solve it um but uh but yeah and tuba is even is a lot worse than euphonium you know it's like tuba can very easily sound just like this like you can still tell what i'm saying but it's like mm -hmm. Sounds like somebody duct taped my mouth, uh, you know, like <laughs> closed. And um, and can you talk a little bit more about the about the um, the air? You said that you changed the air to get a little bit more clarity. Uh, just unpack that a little bit. Uh, I, I it, it, also in my teaching, I, I work a lot with the speed of the air. So if you have a nice slow melody or 
um, yeah, you, you, you're playing something um, and you want a, a big sound. I, I go, I think slowly with the air, like I'm uh, exhaling slowly or sighing. And then um, when you need more clarity than just the, and it, also for high range, the, the speed of the air just goes more, more direct and, and think more of, of pushing the air out rather than just releasing it. Hmm. I just wanted you to say that so that Hiram could hear it, so he could make. Yeah, it, thanks. You know, I'm furiously <laughs> jotting down notes. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm going to send him that clip later. I'd be like, I don't mean anything by this. It just in case you wanted to listen to this part again. Yeah. Okay. Or... So can we really nerd out? Do you yeah. do you think about uh, tongue position for that as well? Uh yeah yeah also yeah mm -hmm. yeah so the lower you play the lower your tongue like sure. uh, it's it's easy over here because everybody likes cheese and raclette um so and you eat you eat it with potatoes so to my students i say I think you've got a, a potato for your raclette in your mouth right. and then you play your low note oh. <laughs> and then uh <laughs> and then try trying I, I i didn't find one to put your tongue very high and, and to the front for the high stuff but um maybe S you've got uh, some singing ideas. like michael jackson he <laughs> he Right. Yeah. That's yeah. It. But uh, I'm afraid that they all start grabbing their balls. So ah, you don't want that. What is this? This is like <laughs> we were getting like real pedagogy here, and then like all of a sudden he's like he's singing Michael Jackson, and you're talking about grabbing balls, and and this just went sideways. Um, <laughs> the uh, what's a raclette? Is that what you said? I don't I don't know what that is. You don't know? Oh, mm. you have to you have to come over to Switzerland then. Um, it's uh, you've got like rounds of cheese. You cut it in half, so you've got half. It's like half a moon of cheese, mm -hmm. and then you put it uh, under like something that heats it, so it melts. It's only the top that melts, mm -hmm. um, and then you just go with a knife and you go on on the uh, and you just splash it on on a plate, and you put some pepper on it and uh, and you eat it. It's just cheese everywhere. This sounds amazing. Yeah. Pot yeah. Potatoes cheese. and cheese. Potatoes oh, and yeah. cheese. Yeah. Oh, I love cheese. I I once went to a, a Whole Foods in Houston when I was on tour. I went, It opens at 7. I went in at like 7.03 and right in the doorway... Uh, there was a there was a cart that was you know somebody was was wheeling it was a cart full of cheese there was like there had to have been like two thousand dollars worth of cheese on this on this wheeled cart <clears throat> that had just been left there by a worker and they just hadn't like gotten into the cheese side I've never stolen a single thing in my life and for just a split second I was like I could get that this thing's on wheels I could get that thing's nobody here I could get all of that cheese in my car and like and like I could be driving away in 12 seconds yeah with like two thousand dollars worth of cheese I thought and I didn't steal it but I was tempted I'm not gonna lie I was tempted because that'd be pretty awesome show up at my buddy's house who I was staying with me like I got some cheese <laughs> you probably would have called the cops if I'd shown up with two grand worth of cheese anyway now I'm thinking about cheese um, so why is Switzerland so beautiful? It's like baffling. It's just like uh, just stunning. Like everywhere is stunning. Rex Martin, my teacher and mentor, he's always you know posting photos of his um, of his cycling bike trips. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's just oh, it's just so beautiful. My goodness. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I'm I'm very lucky. So my wife is Swiss, and then I'm from Belgium. So we started on a long distance relationship, and then when I first visited here, it was like we were talking about yeah if if this gets long term what what should we do i was like i'm moving here <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah we're not staying in belgium there's no yeah. sun in belgium <laughs> look at these mountains same yeah. thing happened to rex martin where yeah he <clears throat> is married to a uh, to a wonderful uh, swiss woman and um yeah and she moved to chicago with him but that was on the condition that they were going to move to switzerland wow. uh yeah eventually and that's um yeah that's why he retired from northwestern after quite a run so but uh, but yeah it's now he now his uh now he has to uh yeah like ride <laughs> ride through he the swiss mountains bike. Yeah. yeah oh so you're an avid cyclist. Uh, uh, how did you get into cycling? Um, well, in Belgium, it's flat like a pancake, so everybody mm -hmm. uh, rides a bike. Um, yeah. And my my granddad, he uh, he rides a bike. He's he's 87 now, and he still rides his bike oh, wow. three times a week. Wow! Um, and then, <laughs> uh, so I actually I, I've always done it when I was young. I had a, a little bike, and I would just 
went for kilometers around the house. Um, and then uh, almost 10 years ago now, uh, my one of my cousins died in a, in a car accident. And I thought it was nice to spend time with my granddad, um, as much time with my granddad as, as possible. So uh, I know he likes bikes and I, I like bikes. So that's when I actually bought my first real um, cycling bike, road race bike. Road bike. Um, yeah, to, to, uh, to go out on the bike with him. Hmm. And now, of course, I, I don't go out with him anymore because because uh, I'm in Switzerland. But um, um, yeah, it's just cycling over here in the mountains. It's 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 amazing. So it's a funny story. I when, when I I took my road bike from Belgium to Switzerland, um, but the scenery is not not the same. So after struggling for a year getting up those hills, I took my uh, my bike for service to a, a local shop. And then he looked at the bike and he was like, where did you get this? I'll put in some more gears for you. It might, might be easier. And I was like, oh, I, I, should, I should have known this a couple of years, a couple of months ago because I've been struggling. <laughs> but yeah, that's a you did, you short side note on the euphonium gears. plane. Yeah, no, no. Wow, amazing. So Glenn, are you an Eddie Merckx fan? Uh, yeah, but it was way before my time. So sure. I, I know of him and I, I see him on interviews on, on TV. But uh, yeah, yeah, but, I'm, but... A, I'm a Wout van Aert fan. Yeah, there and, you go. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm quite a big fan of Quinn Simmons as well, the American guy. Yep. The American young guy. Yeah. And uh, yeah, for uh, most Americans now have absolutely no idea what the hell we're talking about right now. But uh, me we're, included. We're <laughs> We're talking about. Oh, I, I thought I thought I was going to be popular now, saying an an American name. <laughs> there, the uh, what, did, yeah, what does this have to do with football? <laughs> we're uh, we are talking about uh, about professional cycling. So yeah, the the greatest uh, the greatest cyclist of all time, uh, and I don't think it's close, is Eddie Merckx, who's like who's now about eighty, I think. Maybe okay. he, yeah, he's he's maybe I think in his very early eighties. But um, his nickname was the Cannibal. <laughs> Because yeah. he like, yo, she didn't, it, which was given to him by a teammate's daughter because the, uh, the teammate was like, yeah, Eddie doesn't really like anybody else to win anything. Cause yeah, the guy was like, he was, uh, he was unbelievable and he's still very active. Um, and Fabian Cancellara actually from Switzerland. That's uh, yeah. one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite cyclists. So yeah, I love cycling, but I have no American. See, I, I mentioned someone like Hiram and they just stare at me. Like, I'm like, you know, talking about clarinet fingerings. So you know. I've heard of that Fabian guy. How there does you that go. sound? Yeah, that's, that's actually that's that's well, pretty I'm, good. You should be impressed. I, I we both Glenn. I, I don't want to speak for Glenn, but I think we're both very impressed. Yeah. Wow. With, uh, Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. You know, with uh, with a lot. Um. All right. So there's uh, there's one more uh, thing that uh, well there's there's two more things uh, before we um we uh, wrap this uh, since we're just about out of time. Um, the first is that you were a competitive gymnast as a kid. It's like, yeah, which like, which supposedly uh, Glenn told Hiram one night when they were like, you know, like DMing each other on Instagram. No, um, no, it no. was an interview. No, oh, we it was did an interview. Like that. Yeah, no, we got oh, bored. Oh. We got bored during the pandemic. And I was like, hey, man, let's talk. Okay. I thought, yeah. I thought the, oh, it was, I, so I see. So it was on we Instagram. We did like a, yeah. Instagram live. Now I understand. <clears throat> there you go. Um, yeah. I mean, I totally watched all of those that you did during the pandemic. So I, I remember, um, sorry, I was too busy watching Eddie Merck's videos. Um, so uh, you were, a, a, so tell me about, I had no idea that you were a competitive gymnast. Not that you were like into gymnastics, but that you competed. Ta like, so how were you like this, like 11 year old superstar, but you were also a competitive gymnast. Like, what, did you clone yourself? Like, how did this work? <laughs> no, no. Um, but it, it was when I was very, very young. So okay. um, I, I started gymnastics. Uh, well, I, I can't remember when I started. Um, and uh, I kept doing it till I was 12. Uh, but we just had, uh, had uh, national competitions and regional competitions. Um, and uh, then when I was 12 and I went to high school, then um, or, or what's high school in, in Belgium when you're 12, you, um, my, my parents said, uh, okay, so you, you've got a lot of time with music and you've got a lot of training with gymnastics, so you'd have to choose. And actually, when I was younger, uh, I wanted to be a professional gymnast. Um, but um, yeah, I think I'm happy that I took the euphonium road and not the gymnastic road. 
Yeah, gymnastics would have already been over. Like yeah, you'd be yeah. a teacher now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Re- retired former gymnast. Yeah, Glenn right. Van Loy. Yeah, it was the ripe old age of thirty-one. Yeah, that's uh, that's really so. You, it sounds like you were good at, at gymnastics as well. Then. Yeah, I think I think I was okay. I, I wasn't good in all the uh, all the different things, but the, the one I was was good at was just the floor exercises, like uh, doing. Uh, um, backflips and, and and that kind of stuff and walking on your hands um, and I, I actually in, I incorporated it we, we had a, a brass group uh, called exit brass and it was a, a brass quartet um, and uh, we, we'd have a we, we had a show uh, it was uh, when when nozzle brass started to be really successful and uh, so we we tried to imitate a little bit or, or do more stuff than just playing music um and one of the things was my euphonium was already on stage and the cornets would play like a fanfare and i would walk on on my hands <laughs> and then roll over and then grab the euphonium and, and start the piece <laughs> i want to see hiram sub yeah, on where's, that on where's that the gig. video where's the video it, it's where's somewhere on youtube yeah really i'll try i'll try and find it for you guys oh, later oh please, man please do uh well if uh if if Glenn, Glenn is going to send that to me, so you need to check the show notes because that uh, <laughs> that needs to happen. That's uh, you know, I the uh, the floor you know a floor routine in gymnastics to me in some ways seems like the hardest. Is not that I would be able to do the uneven bars or like the I mean any of it right, but like the floor is like it's just a floor, and then like you got to like jump in the air high enough to be doing flips and stuff. It just seems like the gravity is working against you, not for you. <laughs> so that. That seemed, what yeah, was but, your worst? Uh, sorry, go ahead. But if you fall, you don't fall that high because if you're on the on the high bars, then you can just uh, break your neck or something. <laughs> so I, was, I think I think I was scared, and you know, the, um, I don't know what the English word. It's like a horse, and you've got two things Pummel to horse. hold. Pummel horse. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. That. So there was one time I was I was doing some exercises there, and and I fell with my on the so. That's when I thought, ah, oh, I'm just sticking to the floor. Yeah, there you go. It just takes an injury. Yeah, and like- and Andy, you would be doing the uneven bars, wouldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I like that before he was like talking about uh, Michael Jackson grabbing his balls. And now he was just like, and I hit my mm, like, yeah, he's like, it's like, it's like a random. It's, uh, yeah, it's a, yeah, exactly. It's, it's a random censorship. So um, actually have, have either of you ever seen the, um, the clip? Uh, this has nothing to do with uh, Glenn or the euphonium, but um, the, the, yeah, I think it's a Jimmy Kimmel that um, who hosts one of the late night um, uh, talk shows here in the U.S. Glenn, um, he does a, a bit that has has aired a few times. It's called um, "Unnecessary Censorship." Yes, and um, and yeah, Glenn, if you've not seen this, you need to you need to check it out because it's hilarious. I'll I'll send you a link. Uh, it takes a talk from someone where there's absolutely nothing inappropriate. There's no bad words at all. Like. You know, like Fabian Cancellara talking after winning a race, but then they will bleep out words that make it sound like they said swear words. <laughs> so, and it's like, Very it's a, it's absolutely ridiculous. So there's it's some great. prime minister somewhere who it sounds like they're cursing up a storm. It's very, very creative. So, um, yeah. yeah, yeah. All you need are like a, a normal person saying normal things and some random bleeps, and then it, it can get real funny real fast. So what was your worst? Uh, so it sounds like it was like the, the high bar. Was that your worst uh, uh, thing as a gymnast? Yeah, I think so. And rings as well, because uh, the high bar you can still move a little bit with, but the rings, you just have to do everything with your body. Right. Um, so it it needed so much core and it just uh, it was aching right. everywhere afterwards. Right. So I didn't like that. <laughs> what what is exercise? Yeah, right. I don't even know what this stuff is. So <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. I, yeah, I did. Are, are the... you in the army? <laughs> yeah, I'm in the Marines. I had... <clears throat> it's it's negotiable. <laughs> So, uh, Glenn, all of the military bands in the United States, uh, you when you when you win one of the jobs with the band, you have to go to basic training, with the exception of the band that Hiram is in. <laughs> so, oh, okay. that yeah, explains, so, yeah, yeah, it explains a it lot. Explains it so much, it. doesn't it? Hiram right. has been to as much basic training as I have. Yeah, which, uh, yeah, that's not, not true. Oh, did, were you in another band first? I was in the army bands. I didn't know that. 
Yes. I didn't know that. Now you know. I was in the I was in the United States Army bands for one year, five months, and twenty seven days. I see. Look at you teaching. I went. Stuff. Yeah. yeah. So did I went that to basic training. The training, or did yes, you move yes, up? Yes, it included yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> oh, and so you. Yeah. Okay. I went to basic training, man. I learned how to shoot a rifle. I learned how to march in formation. I called cadence. You know what calling cadence is like. You know, you say something and they respond to you like around her hair and then they have to say it back to you and you know one two three four one two it was great i was really good at that i was really good at that <laughs> you should teach glenn all that stuff it might help him with his clarity you yeah know, and his time yeah yeah his time <laughs> you know. oh that's great uh okay last thing wait yeah oh no I go, was go ahead ask him speaking of clarity tell me about these horn uh the 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 valve caps the valve bottoms that you developed yeah i, I didn't develop anything they you didn't develop them it. they just no, sent they, it to you they send it to me and then uh, I'm, I'm endorsing it now but uh, nice don't tell anybody else uh, <laughs> it's just an interview. Nope. Yeah. nobody listens to this nobody <laughs> at all it's like like that's my awesome. mom my mom will hear it that's about it <laughs> yeah no, but it's just a, a heavy bottom cap, um, right. and you can you can screw on more uh, weights if you want to, mm -hmm. um, and it's it's only for the fourth valve. Right. So when they send it to me, I thought, ah, oh, that's just uh, some tool Gimmick. which yeah, which won't work, and it makes the horn heavier. Um, but it, I was actually really surprised when I when I screwed it on. Um, so I thought, yeah, this this could be something, and, and it gave clap. you more clarity, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because uh, it, it's explained on the on their website. But um, yeah. um, I think like a sound can go like like this. But can uh -huh. people see this? No. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, no. some people oh. will listen. Some people will watch. But yeah. Yeah. So the sound goes like this, and then it makes it go right in the space where it should be. Mm -hmm. So it holds uh, a lot more with, with the heavier for, weights. For people just listening, he was just giving us the middle finger the entire time when he was describing that. <laughs> it was really weird. It was with weird. A, <laughs> with a glimmer in his eye. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's oh, cool. I, I, I experienced that too. I haven't done it to my horn because I, I think this instrument is a little too punchy sometimes, but... Um, I experienced that. You put a little bit, maybe different different alloys and different metals down there and different weights. It, it all changes. Pretty cool. Just the fourth valve, just that compensating valve. It's really yeah. interesting. Hmm. Cool, man. And you've also, didn't you also develop the Cardinal Euphonium? Didn't you help develop that as well? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, that's awesome. So when I, when I was with Geneva, I played on the symphony, which is like the sovereign model, if you want to compare sure. it with, with uh, Besson. Uh, and they had... A, a top model the cardinal um, um but it was just in uh rose brass um okay. which makes it more like you were saying uh andrew with the yeah. uh, you, you just got some uh mm -hmm. something a, a cloth in your mouth or something mm -hmm. um so uh we we they they desperately wanted me on on the cardinal and then um we started change materials like you said and so now it's got it's all yellow brass and it. it's got the sterling silver no, a nickel silver uh -huh. uh, um, flare. So it's just the the, the bottom, uh, uh, no, the bottom, the top, the okay. top of, of of your bell um, is is in nickel silver. Oh wow, wow! Right, the flare, the flare. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> That's cool. Hmm. See, I have made it a point to be completely uneducated about whatever metal is being used on my euphonium. I am the best euphonium tester because I have literally no idea what i'm doing <laughs> it's like when you're playing trombone <laughs> I, yeah, that's right i don't know what the bell is made out of i don't i don't even know what size it is and i refuse to measure it i you i could just take a tape measure and just look and see if it's a bigger bell or a smaller i refuse i would rather be such an ignoramus or not know anything about the euphonium because what for <laughs> well if it, if it works it works you don't have to know what it is exactly yeah exactly yeah you know i it's interesting i i like to um i like to make fun of uh you know like of of equipment people you know like people that get way into equipment and yet uh absolutely like when you have the right equipment it makes it a lot easier for glenn to sound like glenn or for hiram to sound mm -hmm. like hiram you know and so um yeah or for so hiram to sound like glenn well yeah <laughs> 
<laughs> Keep telling yourself that, man. Yeah, we all we all gotta have dreams. We all right. have to have dreams. That's <laughs> uh the last thing, you're recording an album this summer. Uh tell us uh, tell us about that a little bit. Uh what's gonna be on the album and when can we expect to be able to hear it? Uh I don't know yet when it's gonna be available, but I'll I'll be recording in August, uh I think. Um and it's gonna be an album uh with piano. Um, so I've I've done albums with I've got one with wind band and a couple with brass bands uh, and I've got two with piano but it was for my for my doctorate so it was all research and old music so what I wanted to do now is is play new piano repertoire uh, like uh, I've got um, a sonata uh, written by a Belgian composer for euphonium and piano um, and then uh, I probably want to record Pearls Two by Roland Senpali. Um, mm. some chamber music, more chamber music than just euphonium solo and, and piano. Okay. Um, but I, I, I haven't, the, I haven't figured out the whole, uh, track. Uh, maybe some yet. brass quartet, maybe some quartet stuff. Yeah. I think it's just going to be, um, euphonium and piano. Okay. Were you trying to get you and I a gig there, Hiram? Or you, uh, uh, look, yeah. Yeah, actually. <laughs> yeah. I feel like we got three right here. We just need one more. Um, <laughs> Speaking of, uh, I lied. That wasn't the last thing because uh, this just reminded me. Speaking of Roland, uh, he I, I, he was who I saw broke the news yesterday uh, that Roger Bobo passed away. Um, yeah. Well, just uh, your thoughts on on Roger Bobo, Glenn, and on his impact on low brass in general. Yeah, it's huge. Well, because um, he he was over in America. He's, he's been living in Japan lately, hasn't he? Or he's been he, he's no, been he in was, Mexico. He was in Japan, Mexico. and then he moved, uh, yeah, to Mexico. I'm not sure exactly how many years ago, but it's been a few. Yeah. But he all, he also did a long stint in Switzerland, so everybody over here right, of course. Uh, knows of course. who he is. And uh, I'm 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 teaching with his books as well um, for for my low brass students. So everything he's done and he's opened for for the tuba and euphonium world was just uh, big, huge. Yeah. So I yeah I I saw it yesterday night as well, and then now everybody. Um, um, seems to know about it, but yeah, yeah. I, I knew he was he, he was unwell for uh, a long time. So yeah, unfortunately. Yep. Yeah. What a uh, what a career. I mean, just like mm -hmm. I I think unparalleled in terms of reaching those heights as a as a soloist, uh, as uh, as a teacher, as an orchestral player. I mean, it's like you can. You can know about his solo records and then not realize that he was like in the LA Phil for that long. I mean, you know, it's like he just, yeah. Amazing. I think the the capstone, honestly, just think about this: is until a modern tuba player goes on uh, Kimmel or Fallon and plays the Carnival of Venice, <clears throat> like yeah. he did. You know, he went on. That's that was my introduction to Roger Bobo was. Somebody say, hey, watch this. And I was, you know, 15 years old, was watching a video of Roger Bobo playing the Carnival of Venice on a late night talk show watched by millions of Americans. Like, yeah, yeah like, think about that. Yeah. Just, yeah. Boom. Good yep. luck. You know, thank you. A real, a real road paver for us. So, yep. Yeah. Um, he's, just, he's a very clever guy as well. Cause I remember when I met him first, it was in Jeju actually. Um, and then he, he came up to me and he said, so you're from Belgium? I said, yeah, so you speak Dutch? And he started speaking Dutch to me because he was in the orchestra in, in Amsterdam, in wow. a concert right. I was like, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm talking my native right. language with Roger, Roger, Roger Bobo. It's just yeah. <laughs> incredible. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Yep. He is, uh, he is missed. Yeah, he's uh, amazing. Amazing. Uh, he leaves... Beautiful thing is he leaves a lot behind in the form of recordings, in the form of interviews, in the form of uh, of books, of like you know of all that, uh, which is great. He lived a very public life, um, you know, musically. So there's, uh, yeah, which is great. Like yeah, he's he's not with us anymore, but um, but he's gonna live on for a very very long time. I can't remember who who posted this. Said um, uh, Steve Dumain uh, posted who plays tuba here in the National Symphony in D.C. Where he said. Uh, he said every tuba player studied with Roger Bobo, whether they realize it or not, which um, which I think was uh, was really well said. So, and you neglected to mention some really great stories. Oh yeah, yeah, he was a legendary <laughs> storyteller. Yeah, like guys that like had careers and, like that. and stories about him. Uh, yes, well that that yes. that is also true. Yes, yep, yeah, he um, he lived an interesting life, so yes. to say the least. 
Um, Glenn has lived like an interesting life. It's shocking that you're 31, dude. I mean, like when you when I look at you know you look at your bio and you see that all of the things that you've done, and it's just like it's like how did you fit that into like wait a minute wait yeah maybe now he's gonna be like wait I just redid the math I'm 32. <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought when you said when you look at and, and you went to like that to the screen, so I thought you were gonna say when you look at your head and your hair. Oh no, you don't look. <laughs> You look, you look like you're you look like you're my you look, age like 47 <laughs> yeah like no that is not what i was going to say um <laughs> that's uh, that's pretty funny though um no it's just you know it's it's uh it's exciting to think of what you can <laughs> what you can accomplish musically in the next like you know 40 years i mean that's like hey, you got a, you got a lot of runway in front of you which is uh, which is exciting which is really exciting at least for for me to get to just kind of sit here and watch and you're already cre recording more. It's sounds like you're, you know, the, the gears are always turning with you, which is, uh, which is wonderful. So yeah. Thank you for all of it. Um, and Hiram, thank you. You're, you're a gift. You truly are. You're a gift to, to all of us. I tried to make that sound sincere. I'm hoping that, hoping that works. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's uncomfortable. Uh, all right. Get for something to show you. <laughs> the uh, yeah, there you go. Um, the uh, all right. So we are gonna have um, we are gonna have uh, Glenn stick around here for the bonus episode, which is available um, for um, for the backers of the Brass Junkies. Uh, if you go to Patreon.com/slash the Brass Junkies, then you can uh, learn how. There's a lot of ongoing costs that are associated with uh, with doing something like this, and uh, I think it's really important that we get to hear. Uh, from people like uh, like Glenn, uh, we talked to Roger Bobo. Um, you know, like uh, just a, a lot of people over the years, and so uh, everyone that has helped to make that um, possible and continues to thank you very very much. Uh, but with every guest, we have them stick around for a bonus episode, uh, which is what we're going to do uh, with Glenn. We're about to hear a story from Hiram about learning to drive stick on the autobahn, which is going to oh, yes. be great. And then uh, one of the old standbys for bonus episodes is asking the guest what um, about something that's gone wrong in concert. It could be like for you, or it could be somebody near you, or even a concert that you've like attended. That there's always like there's always gems in those stories. Um, and then we'll see where it goes from there. Um, Glenn, thank you very very much uh, for joining us. Uh, this has been uh, this has been really wonderful. Thank you for having me. Yeah, of Thanks, course. Glenn. Yeah. Yep. Thanks. And Hiram, thank you. Uh, yeah, this is the <laughs> earliest. Brass Junkies interview that there's well it's supposed to be eight but my computer completely shit the bed so it ended up being like an 815 <laughs> while we all just kind of hung out but um anyway thank you both and uh that is going to do it for another episode of the Brass Junkies. Mm -hmm.